grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent, first Sunday of daylight savings time. For those of you who have not yet gotten your Lenten devotional, there are hard copies uh, on the back table along with uh, the um, newsletter, which I really hope you will read. And today, after worship at 2 o'clock, is the Hunger Walk, and I believe that Eleanor has a um, announcement about that and other served events that we've got coming up. Well, Lee's already said it, and um, I'll bring it across to just make sure if you have a, if you've got one of these, please wear it if you're walking with us. It's not too late for you to donate. You can donate to the Hunger Walk all the way through the end of March which would be great, and we would certainly appreciate any, appreciate any donations. Remember that you must do it all with a credit card online. A big deal. Um, also, just a, a great thanks to everybody who's been bringing things for the bonus cart, which we have chosen to now rename the necessities cart, because all of those items are used and given away every single Saturday. People really need them, so please stay in the habit. It's, a, it's easy to get out of the habit of doing it, but if you just make yourself a member before you shop, one more thing, one more thing, you can go in there. And we appreciate you doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elmar, and thanks to everybody who's been contributing to that. Um, tomorrow night is the book group, and you are welcome, even if you haven't read this month's book, and with questions, I recommend talking to Georgia. Uh, the next Saturday is the Congregational Work Day. This is a biggie because this is our time to spruce up the buildings and grounds ahead of Easter. So if you can be here next uh, Saturday for the Congregational Work Day, doesn't matter about the weather because there's stuff to do indoors and outdoors. And you can talk with Terry or Mark or uh, Johnny um, uh, about that. All right, Easter is just three weeks away. So please, please, Please read the newsletter, especially the back, which is this handy recap of Holy Week at OPC. I should make sure that Nick has seen it too. <laughs> um, so uh, it begins with Palm Sunday, when uh, we will gather with the Ghanaian church, our neighbors um, in the chapel, for a palm-waving parade outside at 9.30. Please be here for that. It'll be lots of fun, and it will really be a an excellent context for that special service. And then Monday, Thursday, uh, we will meet in the narthex for a simple supper and a simple communion service. And last week, last year's event was just beautiful. So I really hope that you can be here for that. The following night, Good Friday, there'll be a powerful service of scripture and uh, song here in the, um, in the sanctuary as the darkness increases the crucifixion as symbolized by the extinguishing of candles. It's a very powerful service on Good Friday. Then Easter Sunday begins with the Easter egg hunt that we need your help with up front. There are bags of empty eggs that need to be claimed and filled and brought back no later than March 24th, two weeks from today. That's the rest of our Lent. Church, Lent is a time of reflection. It is a season of going deep. So let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God as the Christ candle is lit. Please rise in the body of the Spirit and join in the call to worship which is printed in the book. <coughs> From the waters to the wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's name draws near. From the ancestor of nations to the sun lifted up, God's covenant continues. God's name draws near. On tablets of stone, and in our very hearts, God's covenant continues. God's name draws near. We 
follow Jesus on the Lenten path. Because where he is, he will be also. Yes. Yeah. 
Friends, while it is true that we have sinned, it is a far greater truth that we are forgiven by God's love in Jesus Christ. And so to all who humbly ask the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. As the forgiven people of God, we then are free to share signs of peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I love you. I invite you to rise and share signs of peace with each other. Sharpie. So what would it mean for God to write 
on our part. What does that mean to you? It's like do something that would like, you know, like touch us and like, oh, that's good. maybe something like that. Yes, okay, touch us, very personal, yes. What else? What is our heart? What is that? When we talk about that, what does that mean? Not just the blood pumping thing, but when we're speaking more poetically. Love. Love, nice. I think it's like our realist part. The most important part of us is our heart. So God is writing God's love, God's thought, in our love, in our selves, in our most important self. Why would God do that? Any thoughts on that? Like make us who we are. Make us who we are. Brilliant, wonderful answer. Andrew, Nicholas, Ethan, any other ideas? God writing in our hearts. Think of it like it's um, writing in like uh, think adding like something that goes deep, like yes. into us, like something that we know to be true. Like yes, yes, yes. With the Ten Commandments, I might have to run over here and check on the list that's written down somewhere to remember a post number eight. But if it's written in my heart, there's no forgetting it. Part of who I am. Like what's right and what's wrong. Nice. Yes. Yes. Well done, Alan. Okay, so that's our covenant for the day. Let's have a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for the rainbow and the stars and the tablets of stone. Thank you also for loving us so much. Thank you also for loving us so much. Write your law within us. Amen. Thank you. All right. I hope I see y'all on the other one. by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first scripture reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
just heard two biblical passages about God giving us an extraordinary gift. In the Jeremiah text that Jeff read, God speaks of giving a new covenant, different from prior covenants. This new covenant, as I noted with the guys earlier, will be inscribed not on stone, but on our hearts. It will connect us with God that intimately, that directly, assuring us that God's forgiveness exceeds our sinfulness. What a gift! And then in the Gospel text, the beloved John 3.16 text that the choir just sang, we hear our Christian understanding of how that new covenant is manifest. God gives the gift through God's Son. God's mercy and power, wisdom and word embodied and given in love. This morning's third scripture passage also focuses on the extraordinary gift of God. Instead of covenant, the terminology here is grace. And this text emphasizes the context that makes God's gift so important, and also the outcome that's possible because the gift is given. This is Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are children of disobedience. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and of thought, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together with Christ, and seated us together with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come God might show the immeasurable riches of God's grace kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so no one can boast. But we are God's handiworks, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This too is the word of God for the people of God. When your birthday falls near Christmas, as mine does, your loved ones are saddled with having to come up with two gifts to give you within a too short a period of time. And so your annual task becomes to offer hints that make it a little easier for them to come up with two sets of gifts within a short period of time. So years ago, shortly after we had moved into the neighborhood near Virginia Highlands' trendy boutiques, December was approaching, and Clark, again, was nudging me for the occasional hint. Well, as it happened, I passed by one of those cute boutiques, and my eye was caught this one window display. Three party dresses, completely impractical, fluttery, shimmery, breathtakingly impractical. They gleamed in the winter gloom, vivid yellow, brilliant pink, blazing orange. Oh, that orange one. And this was certainly gift material. I mean, no way I buy it for myself. And so I dropped the hint. So I, I, I saw these party dresses in a shop window. One of them is orange. <laughs> sure enough, a couple of days later, a big package appears under the Christmas tree. It's wrapped with the telltale signs of two elementary age sons. Whose gift would that be? 
made giggle and giggle. Christmas morning, and sure enough, my boys bring me that big package. For me? They nod with shining eyes, and I begin to unwrap it. Even before all the wrapping is gone, I see a glimpse of, yes, orange. All the wrapping removed, I unfold a bright orange rain jacket that somehow becomes separated from its bass boat. <laughs> My sons are beaming at me so that you can take your walk, Mommy, even when it's bad weather. I put that jacket on that very day and the next day and most of the days for the next decade and a half. I wore that jacket thousands of times more than I would have worn a blazing orange party dress. <laughs> it was the gift I needed. I just didn't know it. Gifts from God can be kind of like that. Teaching us that God knows our situation better than we do. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Church, we really need to comprehend this gift from God. Now, due to my prior life as the writer of museum exhibits, this text makes me want to transport us all to a fabulous, immersive museum exhibit with a tour guide to help us better understand the great good news of this passage. So let's imagine together a, an exhibit entitled The Human Condition, Grief, Grace, and Gratitude. In the opening gallery, there's a historical overview. Now, if you love a good diorama, picture that. If virtual reality is more your speed, picture that. It doesn't matter. The message is the same. Here, in tones, our guide, is humankind as we once were, living in death. Notice how we're all going along with the priorities of this sin-sick world, even following the ruler of the power of the air. Now that's a term that ancient people used to describe whatever malevolent forces sought to separate us from God. Do you see how everyone does whatever they want to do without thinking of the consequences? Sort of like toddlers. Well, that is humankind's predicament. And now if we move to the next gallery, notice here how God, purely out of love, especially for all of us who were doing our own thing rather than seeking God's ways, God has given us the gift of bringing us from death to life in Christ. You may have to look closely, but you can see the differences. However subtle on the outside, those differences are profound. We've been given a whole new way of life. You can see that we're blessed to be alive in Christ, even as we continue to navigate the same world. So, now there was how it once was, and this is the way it is now. And at the end of our tour, you'll find an interactive gallery where you can explore possible responses to God's gift. But first, we focus on how that death was transformed into this life. The instrument of that transformation is the subject of our main gallery. Welcome to the gift of grace. I wish we had such an exhibit, because this gift matters. Classically defined as unmerited favor, Grace is a gift that we can't fully appreciate unless we grasp how desperately we need it. The writer of Ephesians, probably a devotee of Apostle, the Apostle Paul, is definitely impressed with our neediness, declaring that we were nothing short of dead through the, our trespasses and sins, that we lived while following the ways of the world. That writer had in mind particular issues of that time and place. But we, too, are utterly enmeshed in the messes of our time and place. 
trapped in systems that we didn't create, but upon which our lifestyle is based. By way of example, consider sexism and racism. Those of us who benefit from our gender and or our ethnicity did not construct the lies that pale skin is the best skin, that men are the most valuable people. We didn't concoct that poison. We involuntarily inherited it. We did not design the world this way. And yet we participate in it every day. And that's why, as Ephesians emphasizes, we cannot possibly free ourselves from systemic sin. We were by nature children of wrath. But God, out of the great love of which God loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We are recipients of this gift of life from the giver of life. It's hard to comprehend such a gift. The generosity is so lopsided, you just sort of shake your head. There's a passage from Billy Collins's The Lanyard that helps me see the outlandish imbalance built into receiving such a gift from such a giver. Colin writes this. I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift from my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lamb. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of needles, she said. And here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lander, I replied, which I made with a little help from my counselor. Here is a breathing body, a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, two clear eyes with which to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift. Not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took that two-toned lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless worthless thing that I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. There's something in there of God's gift that we hear of in all three of this morning's scripture passages. She gave me life. She nursed me in many a sick room. She led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk. She provided for me not only food and clothes and education, but even my very body and the opportunity to experience this world. It's a gift of such magnitude that it cannot be earned, much less repaid. And yet we itch to imagine ourselves active agents in this arrangement, don't we? Surely there is something we can do to earn God's grace something we can do to repay it. That's why theologians have spent 2,000 years saying, no, y'all, it's pure gift. God offers unearned and unearnable grace. You cannot deserve it. You can only respond to it. As receivers of God's gifts of grace, 
we can respond via a life of, as the author put it, good works. Even when the world seems immune to good. And that is the final gift that today's text points us to. Our passage concludes, For we are God's handiworks, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Doing good works as a way of life. What a faithful response to God's gift of grace. Good works do not lead to grace. You follow from it. As receivers of God's gift, we respond via a life of good works. Church, we can have no doubt that we are enmeshed in sin. Even as we grieve its ugly cost, we can give thanks for its remedy. God gives us the gift of grace because, as our text says, we are God's handiworks, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Not as a means to grace, but as a response to grace. God gives us the capacity to do good. Oh, church, may we receive that gift. And may our lives give Thanks to the giver.
God is unfailing in grace and love. With thankful hearts, let us bring to God a portion of all God that, has, that God has given to us. Let us offer our lives, our labor, and our music.
hearts and minds. Let us come before God in prayer. Holy God, you created us in Christ Jesus for good works, not to earn your love, which we have already received by your great grace, but to respond to that love and to share it beyond ourselves. And so we bring before you now the concerns of this world that you so love. Be with the leaders of the world. May those who make human laws do so mindful of your law that is written in our hearts. Be with the helpers of the world, teachers and librarians, doctors and nurses, sanitation workers and social workers and aid workers. Give them courage and resilience and joy. Be with parents and children, spouses and siblings, friends and enemies, neighbors and strangers. May all our relationships reflect your gifts of grace and mercy. Be with all who have special need of your presence today. In particular, we think of Gretchen, Linda, and her family. We give thanks for good health. We give thanks for this beautiful day and the opportunity to go on the hunger walk as one of the good works that we do in response to your grace. Thank you for receiving the content of our hearts, and thank you for loving this world. All this we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray.
gift of God's grace and the opportunity to do good works in response to that grace. And as you go, may you know the love of the one true God who is the source, the Son, and the Spirit this day and always. Amen. Amen.